Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast, brought to you by Make Lemonade. Today, we have David Tao. He is the CEO of Barbend.com, or the previous owner. He was now just acquired by a bigger company, and he's running that now. So if anyone is in the fitness space or just interested in large acquisitions, this will be perfect for you. And we go into how he started the site, was where it is now, was that the intention when he started, how he broke into, a, I guess you would call it a saturated or very hard niche through a different angle, not just going straight for the affiliate or display of content, but going actually through the news route. So that's how we ended up growing the site. Initially, we look at some of his content team, how much content they're producing, and then partnerships, partnerships and sponsorships, how they've gone out and partnered with various companies within the strength sports space and what has made them so successful compared to other sites. Obviously, a lot of you might be in niches, you know, pet niche, whatever, that has a lot of different sites on there. But what separates these larger sites that get all this traffic and rank for everything compared to some other sites who are also high domain authority or have a lot of authority but uh, don't rank or don't bring in as much traffic as these ones. So it's a very interesting episode. Um, you'll enjoy it. But sit back and enjoy. Are you ready to get serious about building a profitable brand online? Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. We bring you the latest field-tested tips, tricks, and strategies for building a profitable online business. We interview industry experts, share customer success stories, and reveal our own experiences working on hundreds of sites to inspire and motivate you to make something happen. This podcast is brought to you by Make Lemonade. Whether you've launched your business yesterday or you're already a market leader, Make Lemonade will help you rule your world. Head over to makelemonade.agency forward slash show for the latest offers on our services. Let's do this. All right. Welcome to the Niche Website Builders podcast brought to you by Make Lemonade. And today we have David Tao. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for having me, James. I appreciate it. Happy to be here. No, thank you for coming on. It's not, it's not uh, very often you have to bring your competitor onto the podcast. So this will be, <laughs> this will be good fun. So let's start, let's start with your site, barbend.com. Do you want to maybe start with what the site is about? And for me, I'd love to know how, you, how it got started. Was, was where it is now kind of the, the vision when you began? Or was it just kind of like a small niche site when you started? You know, I would say now definitely, thank you for asking, thank you for having me on, you know, and now I would say it was definitely not the starting vision because, uh, frankly, I didn't, I knew the strength community and people interested in strength training. I knew that was a big opportunity. I didn't know how big it could grow. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the big thing is there are more people interested in lifting weights now than there were seven years ago. Oh, yeah when we started, right? And I think that rising tide kind of helped us helped us grow. But we got started in early 2016. I was a competitive uh, strength athlete. Not a very good one, just to clarify. I like to <laughs> remind people. Um, but I was really passionate about it, and I also had a background in journalism and content. And for me, Barbend was the site I always wish I had. I was very interested in, hey, where can I go to get event results? Where can I go to keep up on the news? Where can I get training content and the latest research? And that didn't really exist. There wasn't kind of a one-stop shop. So for me, Barbend was an attempt to build that. And you know, for the first mm. few years, though, we really just focused on mostly the news, right? So okay. event results, you know, world records, things like that. And we kind of grew from there. So when we started, we were just kind of that news blog, like what's going on in strength. And then as we grew, we were able to expand our editorial capacity and, and write different types of content. Yeah, it's almost like you carved out your own part of the niche. Obviously, at that time, you would have been, if you went straight into fitness content, you would have been competing with like T Nation, bodybuilding.com, men's health, all, all the, all the big, big players in that space. So it's almost like you found, you found a way in that was a lot easier. We we did. It's funny. Uh, the, the example I had in mind back then was, oh, well, we don't want to compete against breaking muscle uh, because, yeah. you know, they're already so, so established. So we'll kind of focus on the news. 
fast forward, we acquired Breaking Muscle in 2021. Oh, I didn't so, realize that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Breaking Muscle is part of the Barbend uh, group of sites, which is part of Pillar 4 Media now. We were acquired mm-hmm. about two, not quite two months ago. Um, so it's funny because you look at your – I was actually just – I mean, this is a very small example of that, but I was just watching the movie Air last week mm-hmm. about uh, Nike signing Michael Jordan, yep. and they're competing against Converse. And, like, Converse is, like, the really, the really big competitor. And then Nike ended up acquiring Converse years later on. Obviously, this is a much, 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 much smaller example of that. But it was really interesting because we didn't enter, we didn't start writing about general strength content, just the news, because you're right, there were the T-Nations of the world, the bodybuilding.coms of the world, the breaking muscles of the world. News is our way to kind of get our foot in the door, and we grew from there. So how do you go about starting to write news content? Well, how do you get traffic from writing news content? Were you spreading this on social media? Was it kind of like a viral thing that you were getting traffic from? Uh, I've gotten asked on a couple interviews since we were acquired. Uh, they said, well, you know, did you push it out the content out on social? And we did. We did push the content out on social. But I want to be c- clear. We didn't have a, like a real social following. Like I people like asked me, oh, did you put it, push it out in your social media? I was like, my social media has got like 2000 followers. No one cares right about my social media. I think we got a little bit lucky because. Uh, when we started, it was 2016, and that happened to be a year with a lot of big hallmark events in strength sports. So World's Strongest Man uh, was a very big event that year, and that was also one of the last years that they didn't report results. Uh, so you had to like kind of they, – they because it was a TV broadcast, they weren't public about the results, so you kind of had to like – figure out where to find it, we were actually able to report on that. Um, the CrossFit Games was very popular that year. It kind of reached a peak of its popularity in, in many ways. It's still growing in some others. Uh, there was also weightlifting at the Olympics, and we were the first to report on accurate, verified results from every weightlifting session. So every weightlifting session at the Rio Olympics, I personally wrote an event recap. So for two weeks, it was just me at my computer. I literally left a friend's birthday party and ran home to write an event recap. Um, and because of that, people started noticing, yeah, people started noticing, oh, well, we can just go to Barbend for all these results. We don't have to go to all these different places. And what then happened was people started linking to us, right? So we started getting links from major sports publications, you know, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, um, those, those writers and those journalists covering these like little niche sports started saying, oh, you know, I can just go to Barbend and I can get the results and, and we can use them as a primary source. So a lot of it was timing. Frankly, you know, I'd like to say that we had some like grand master plan and we did things intentionally, but I think we got really fortunate on the timing because it was a year where people really became interested in results for these sports. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And when you mentioned obviously Pillar 4 Media, where who acquired you guys, but Pillar 4 Media crushing every search term right now, like all the affiliate terms, like top two, top three spots, then a lot of the informational terms, that's crazy. Um, the, the rankings the uh, company or well, the portfolio of companies are, are ranking for. So, I mean, yeah, you, you guys are doing, are doing very well there um, outside of just news content. But uh, I want to actually touch on as well within the news content, the, the whole, your whole process around it. You said you, you wrote a lot of it yourself at that time. But obviously, as you've, as you've expanded, you've got a team behind yeah. you. How does that work? Do you just, you have a whole lot of journalists that cover everything and then edit a few editors and publish? Or what's that process? How's that process go? Yeah, our team has grown quite a bit since then. Um, I think we're we're up over twenty full time people. It's interesting, and because after Pillar Four acquired us, the first thing they did was they asked, "Okay, what resources do you need? What do you need to do to grow more?" Hmm. Um, this was not an acquisition where like people left or they scrapped the website for parts or they like went in and just were like slashing costs left and right. Um, you know, the first thing they did was they said, "Cool, if you had more more resources and more people, what would you do with them?" right? Mm -hmm. Where would you put more, more human capital and more firepower? And then we started hiring those people. So it was really cool. Um, One of the reasons that we really enjoyed uh, that we were very keen on being acquired by pillar four, frankly, was we knew they would take what we were doing and just throw more gas into the engine, uh, which is very much what's happened. But most of our full-time team is editorial, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we do have some folks on biz dev. We have uh, a, a, head of design and head of creative who's fantastic uh we have video staff and that we're excited to expand later this year our video content um we have a lot of really cool um specific talented people on our team but the majority of our team is editorial right it's mm-hmm. editors and writers we work with hundreds of freelancers from around the world and the thing about fitness is the people who are doing the best stuff in fitness they're not sitting at a desk writing all day oftentimes so, some people are but a lot of them are 
coaches, athletes, researchers, right? So they're not full-time writers, but when they do write, it's really fantastic and you want to listen. So we love working with them. Um, and our in-house team is really built around, okay, creating a lot of content in-house uh, and also being able to work with, you know, the best people in in fitness, um, kind of no matter what their schedules are. And Barbin and Breaking Muscle actually have separate editorial teams. So um, we have we have our Barbin team, we have our Breaking Muscle team. Obviously, they're kind of in the same family, but the teams are are separate, and they each kind of have their own tones, their own their the processes are like the editorial flow is like a little different on both those sites. Um, Breaking Muscle is honestly a little more targeted toward. There's some overlap in content, but it's a lot more targeted toward trainers, people who are really in the weeds and want really really specific stuff. Barbend casts a bit of a broader net right now. Um, but yeah, I'd say, you know, 75, 80% of our folks are editorial. I see there. Yeah, I, I like the idea of, you know, not all the the best people you want to write for you aren't just writing all day. They're obviously coaches and actually in the industry. It's like, same on my sites. I've got a bunch of PhD researchers who write some stuff for one of my sites. And then my other main fitness site is um, I've got or World's Strongest Man competitor. Obviously, my wife is, was a commonwealth medalist in olympic weightlifting and things like that so yep. pulling people like that in and i found some hired some more coaches just the other day too so it's yeah I, i'm with you on that and i'm i'm glad at least i'm on somewhat the right track with that <laughs> um, <laughs> how much I, I, th I think you i think you and i have very have a lot of similar and shared experiences and some of that's through yeah. trial and error frankly right yeah for sure for sure and and how much you how much content you're putting out a day currently Oh man, I am no longer the best person to ask that because uh, I, I'm I'm not, uh, you know, I don't touch I don't touch most a lot of our content. Most of our content I don't actually touch. I'm not plugged in in the editorial process because we have people who are much more talented than I am. Uh, we are producing, the way I like to put it, is uh, many dozens of pieces of content per week. Um, so we write a lot more. However much content you think we're producing, we're probably producing more. Um, <laughs> is is the answer? Uh, it's it's very difficult to keep track of. It does ebb and flow, right, with editorial cycles uh, and news cycles. So if it's a heavy news week, yeah. um, we'll produce a higher number of pieces. If it's a lighter news week, some of that editorial capacity will will be pushed elsewhere, right? That's just you have to be. No matter how big you are in content, you have to be a little bit agile, right? I don't yeah. care if you're the New York Times or if you're Barben.com, you have to be adaptable based on what's going on. Um, but yeah, that, what I tell people is like, get enough. Uh, when I was the primary writer on the site, when I was pretty much the only writer on the site, we were producing upwards of 30 pieces a week. So Ooh. now that we have more than one writer on the site, extrapolate that out. Now, you, you know, <laughs> not every writer is producing 30 pieces a week, right? But we're, we're producing significantly more than that. Damn. So you were, you were writing 30 pieces a week? Yeah, yeah. Holy shit! Okay, that yeah, that's a that's a big output there. Yeah. What um, what 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 year did did you start to see Barbie kind of hit that tipping point and take off with traffic? Did it did it take a lot of time? I mean, you've had pretty quick success if you really think about it, and if you really are uh, zoom out. We're pretty public with these. We're pretty public with these numbers. Um, I wrote a media after we were acquired. I wrote a Medium post um, on you know, Medium dot com. You can just you know Google Barbend plus Medium or Barbend plus or David Tao plus Medium or whatever. And I kind of give the playbook. Um, I'm I'm a pretty open book, right? There's some things I can't share, but I'll share most things. Um, our first year, like from March, we launched in March 2016 to March 2017, we had 1.4 million readers. Um, in 2022, we had over 31 million. Uh, this year, we're on track for for a very nice number uh, that I won't say just yet uh, because I want to hit it before we. But you know, we're on track for for um, a number that I'm very excited about. And then I think next year our goal is a number that I'm really excited about to to put it that way. Um, but we did have quick success. Um, it didn't feel quick at the time. You know, that first year felt very long and like a slog. I think we knew we were on to something after about four to five months of publishing. Um, by the time the Rio Olympics rolled around in 2016, we knew we were getting enough traction that this could be something. I don't think we knew the scale that it could grow to. And I think, like I said earlier, part of that was because the strength community overall was just smaller. More people have gotten into lifting weights in the past seven years, which I, I think you would agree, I'm a, maybe assuming, uh, is a good thing. Right, that's a very good thing, and I think it's important to help 
it's an important component of a healthy life for everyone. Um, but, you know, I think 2020 was a really reflective year for us. It's a year we did a lot of hiring. Um, the pandemic was a very difficult time for a lot of people, obviously. Um, it was a time when we had to do a little bit of soul searching as people, and we had to, certainly had to do some restructuring as a business. Um, so Barben didn't really have a super specific corporate structure uh, or executive structure until 2020. Uh, and that's when we kind of reorganized and said, okay, you know, David, me, I'm going to step a little bit outside of editorial. I'm going to become CEO. We're going to hire someone to really run editorial. Um, we're going to have a true CMO, true operations. Like we're going to really focus on scaling this um, and diversifying. Um, and, and so that was probably the tipping point year for us. We had great growth. We were at millions of readers per month already, but that was probably a tipping point year for us. So, so what's your day-to-day -day look like now then? Now that you're, I guess now that you've been acquired, you're, you're in that role. It's, it's a little all over. Um, the transition period has been significant, and I actually think it's a good thing. Um, I was actually really worried that, you know, when we were first starting discussions with Pillar 4, a really important focus for me was uh, transition and for my partners and co-founders was, hey, how are we going to make it such that our team can keep doing what they do best? So the transition period's actually been very long. We transitioned very slowly. Um, everything from HR systems to payroll to insurance to benefits um, to some certain software, we transitioned very, very slowly. For the first month after the acquisition, basically no one on the editorial team's day-to-day -day changed at all. It was mm -hmm. gradually introduced after that. So the past couple months for me, past six weeks, have been a lot of transition um, components. Um, it's been everything from HR systems and working with Pillar 4's great HR team to um, taxes. <laughs> I mean, like <laughs> all the all the really boring, all the really it maybe not boring, but all the stuff that like people don't always get on podcasts and talk about. <laughs> it's been more of that than it ever has because we're, we're we have we're kind of transitioning all that institutional knowledge over to Pillar 4. A lot of like updating credit card information, like everything yeah. that could you're just like looking under the couch cushions like we need to change this. We need to update this. It's just been like an endless supply of that. But that's OK. Um, it, it's been good to see. And then as I move into more of a su support role in that. Um, I've been doing a lot of kind of brand identity work. Okay, mm -hmm. what is Barbin's brand identity? How are we going to get the word out there? What media partnerships are going to be important for us? Um, we're going to be, I don't want to give too give too much of the playbook on this because we haven't done it yet. Um, we're going to be revamping our video and podcasting strategy in a big way. I'm heavily involved in that. Nice. Um, and then, you know, frankly, a lot of people are curious, which is really cool. I'm really flattered that a lot of people are curious about Barbin's story, right? Um you know, a lot of people have uh, reached out some, like, everything from, you know, uh, small town newspapers and places where, like, members of our team grew up to, like, awesome podcasts like yours. Um, the, f the, the kind of first wave was a lot of fitness podcasts and fitness publications yeah. um, were curious, right? And so it's a lot of that. Um, I've been growing and, and banking some more episodes for our own, own podcast. I've been fortunate enough to guest on some uh, like like this one. Uh, this one mm -hmm. I was particularly excited about because I know that we're kind of kindred spirits uh, <laughs> in many ways. Um, and then and then really starting this summer, um, expanding our video and podcasting strategy, becoming really more multimedia um, yeah. is something I'm really excited to be to be involved with. Um, so if you don't like my voice, my apologies, because you'll, you might be hearing a lot more of it. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> does, does uh, being such a big big i guess website and company does any changes to that google's bringing out with the whole ai search experience does that ch scare scare you at all or change anything for you you know I, I i i mean everything's scary everything in content is scary right because things change so rapidly it's so see i'm preaching to the choir here you know what i mean like things can be so seasonal and it can be so unpredictable, but like everything can be scary. Everything in media, media is a scary place right now. One thing that brings me a lot of confidence is that we are a part of a much bigger company now with a, with a track record of riding the waves and, and understanding how to diversify, right? I, I truly think that Bar Ben could only grow so big independently. And I think we were close to where, I think we were close to that peak, right? And that's because, um, you know, we are reliant on these trends. We're reliant on Google. We're reliant on search engines. Being a part of Pillar 4, there's just there's so many more resources spread across a number of really great brands. There's shared knowledge. There's shared um, 
opportunities to learn, uh, personal development for your team. I honestly think we were very close to as big as we could get without the help of a bigger company, right? And without those additional resources and that institutional knowledge. So I'm a lot less scared than I was five months ago because <laughs> I feel like we're at a home and we're at a place where, you know, if as there are big challenges, big core algorithm updates, integration of AI, generative search, things like that, we are at a ho in, in a in a place now where, you know, there are teams dedicated to figuring that out and figuring out how to help Barbend uh, thrive mm. in those environments. Whereas when we were independent, frankly, we didn't have the resources. I didn't have the resources to create an AI team, yeah. right? Or like an AI task force or, you know, head of generative search, like <laughs> strategy, like where is that going to come from in the budget? You know? Yeah. Um, so it is, it does give me a little bit of pause. A lot of these changes, as I'm sure it does for you, for a lot of our listeners, for a lot of the listeners, to this podcast, I'm happy to be at a place that is thinking ahead and, you know, has people in place to really figure out, okay, where do the Pillar 4 brands fit in this? How does Barbend adapt to this changing environment? That's really cool. Nice. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people kind of not sure what's going to happen. For me, I'm just brute forcing my way through it. doesn't matter what's happening. I'm just, I'm just, I just, I just keep going. I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> I, I, hey, I brute, I brute force my way through a lot in life. I think that's a weightlifter's mindset at a certain <laughs> yeah, point, right? Yeah, it has to be. has to be. Now, are you able to share what your main or your your main revenue streams are on Barbend or what you mainly target? I know you have a lot of affiliate stuff and, and uh, I think display ads on there too. And, and then obviously there must, there's a lot of brand partnerships as well within that. So are there, are there certain ones that stand out as main revenue sources for the Barbend or is it just relatively kind of evenly spread? So I can't share the breakdown, um, but you kind of nailed some of the main ones. And I think that's true for a lot of sites these days. You know, I, I like to tell people Barbend's revenue strategy is not that different from a lot of mainstream outlets. We don't have subscriptions, right? You know, uh, you know, you look at folks, I think that if you look at the, the biggest, some of the biggest media companies in the world, let's take the New York Times, for instance, they have a subscription model for access to not only their content, but their apps, podcasts, things like that. But a large percentage of their revenue comes from affiliate. Uh, that's why they purchased the wire cutter however many years ago, right? Um, some of it comes from advertising, direct sponsorship partners, things like that. Um, Barbin is really not much different as far as our revenue streams than mainstream media companies. We just don't have a subscription model. Um, I, It's not really where my strengths lie. Subscription models are not something I have a ton of experience with. It's not really in our game plan for Barband. A lot of folks have said, oh, when are you having a subscription model? When are you going to have premium content? Honestly, it's not really a goal. <laughs> you know, people have asked, like, asked me, been asking me that for years. Um, but, you know, display advertising, brand partnerships, affiliate, they're all impactful for us. Um, you know, and, and I think we'll continue to be impactful. Yeah. Interestingly enough, like T Nation went down that subscription route. They, they turned the whole forum into a subscription. So now the, the the form's no longer free, and yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting they went down that road because it looked like what they they tried to almost do a barbend play. I think it was a couple of years ago. I was checking them out, and they ended up going display ads, and then they went like not just affiliate, but they went almost like spammy affiliate, like on the homepage, just putting Amazon product links to things on the homepage and stuff like that, but with not much else. And then they, then they seem to have changed now. They've got a subscription model and kind of removed all that. So yeah, it's, it's interesting seeing some of these big companies and what they're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that uh, I think that we have had a very different uh, approach to a lot of things compared to T Nation over the years. And, and, you know, T Nation is a site I used a lot. Yeah. Uh, early in my strength career and there's a lot of great content on there you know I've, I've had dan john on our podcast we've talked about nice. the 10,000 swing program uh yeah. which obviously originated on t nation a lot of really good gems there um but i think that t nation especially the forums back in the day uh were not the most inclusive in, um for mm. for people in strength you know um i think that they were um a, a place that could be intimidating for people mm. who we're not kind of quote unquote your typical strength athlete, um, at least what that what that was back in the day. And, and we had always hoped to uh, foster an environment that was a little bit um, inclusive in a different way. Right. And approach that in a different way. 
Um, and I, I think that we've done an okay job at that, but we can do an increasingly better job at that. And as we work to continue, to, to continue doing that, it makes a subscription model less appealing to us, right? Because mm -hmm. if we want to cast yeah. a broad net and grow our readership and, and expand the to the types of people who can benefit from our content, putting it behind a paywall, while not necessarily a bad business move, right? It's just not something that's super appealing to us right now. Yeah. Yeah. And if anyone's checking out T Nation now, you can actually go on the author list. You'll find me on there. I've got a couple of articles on there. I was trying to get some backlinks. They didn't, they didn't link to me on my own articles. So I didn't write for them anymore. How, how, how dare they? How <laughs> I know. Dare they? That's all I did it for. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a bit sad. So I didn't write anymore for them. But I mean, it, it sounds like your growth levers from the acquisition is you had more staff come on, you're pumping out content, you're looking to gain more traffic. Are there any other growth levers you're looking to pull now you have these resources? I'm thinking big picture. I'm thinking, I mean, you could, you rank for so much. You could sell your own supplements, your own workout gear, all that kind of stuff. Has that ever entered the picture? We could. Um, it's not where we're strongest right now. You know, we are content people, right? We love producing content. We love <laughs> writing and editing and filming and recording. Um, I'm not going to say any of that stuff is out of the question. Actually, we have explored some of that. We used to sell branded bar bend belts and like t-shirts and stuff like that yeah and, my wife's uh, got the socks you know frankly we yeah the socks yeah we used to yeah. sell the socks uh those socks hold up like they're 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 like you know um yeah. but eventually we just realized it wasn't what we were best at and you know every bit of time we were you we were doing inventory or something like that was time that we weren't producing content um mm -hmm. and so uh, you know, people say, oh, is that coming down the pipeline? Well, it's been in the pipeline. We <laughs> honestly weren't the best at it. So we stopped doing it. I'm not going to say we won't do it again. Um, yeah. Because people like product, you know, people, I'm, I'm a, I love, man, I got more weightlifting belts than I, than I use <laughs> literally. Like, you know what I mean? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense how many weightlifting belts I have uh, or knee sleeves or things like that. I have all these pairs of knee sleeves and there's just one, the same stinky pair I use every time. Right. Yep. But, um, yeah, just it's not what really it's not where we thought we could scale. Maybe it'll happen again, um, but you know, it, it's. I think there are a lot of ways to make money in this space that we just haven't that we've decided are not for us at this time. You know what I mean? Uh, like creating our own supplement line. I know it's something like you give the example of T Nation, right? They they're they're part of a company that has its own supplement line. Cool, great. Not not really what we want to do, right? We don't really want to make supplements. We want to make content. Um, and we think we can be the best at making content. I don't know if we could be the best at making supplements, right? Like, I don't know. We, we'd, we'd have to figure that out. And it's obviously it's such a tough market too. Like <laughs> some, I mean, if someone's coming out with new supplements and energy drinks and stuff every damn day. Uh, I mean, you, I mean, you've got the brand and audience to do it, but I mean, it's such a, it's such a low effort thing when you're already ranking for all like the best supplement keywords. You, I mean, you're killing it just doing that without having to worry about overhead staff, warehousing, um, <clears throat> shipping times, all that kind of stuff. And you just continue down that content. It's interesting how far you can get with just, just the content model. Because a lot of people talk about, you know, you do content, but eventually you've got to kind of branch out and be more business-like and do more physical products and business things. But it sounds like you guys are just like, fuck it. We're just going to stay content. We're good at it. And we can content just make isn't, it there. Content is a business. Content mm -hmm. is a product. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think that... Uh, I've heard people say, oh, you need to turn it into a business now. We are a bit like we are a business. <laughs> We're a pretty big business. We drove we drove nearly 20 million dollars of merchandise value for our partners last year. Right. That's that's a that's actually an underestimate. Right. That's also not that's not counting display advertising. That's not counting. Right. Like that's a lot of value we're driving. Our content is a business for us. Um, I know it's something you know, but there's a lot of media doom and gloom right now. Like I live in New York City, and BuzzFeed News just shut down, and Vice Media just declared bankruptcy, and Spotify just laid people off this week, um, and like there's all this media doom and gloom. But there are success stories, and some of the niche content businesses like Barben, we're seeing success, right? Because we didn't have part of that's because we didn't have a ton of venture capital thrown at us. Right. And we, we didn't we didn't scale too quickly. We probably scaled too slowly. We got turned down by every venture capitalist we pitched when we were raising seed money. Like everyone. I had so many I had a meeting at a coffee shop where I was talking to this VC 
and it was going I thought it was going pretty well. He went up to go to the bathroom and he just left. <laughs> Like he just never, he just never came back, right? Like it was a lot of, and like that wasn't even the worst meeting I had, right? Like that was just we had just a ton of those, Mm -hmm. and because of that, we had to build our company to grow on its own because we didn't think that there was more money coming. Yeah, and I think that fundamentally changed the course of our business for the better. Yeah, nice. When you were when you were writing your own content, so you were the main writer. When you started making that money, how, I guess you mentioned you scaled slowly. So how, how slow are we talking? Are we saying, okay, you brought on maybe one or two writers in the beginning and you kind of started with them and built from there? Or are we saying you kind of, yeah, went yeah. we brought like two employees on and, and didn't hire any more full-time folks for like a year and a half. And then it was like one at a time, you know, one mm-hmm. employee every three to four months, maybe two or three a year. It was very slowly kind of at that pace. Okay. That's, that's good to know, yeah, because I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this thinking, okay, like, how how can I go about building my team and, and kind of not spending so much money on the team compared to what you're bringing in and, and be able to scale, I guess, safely and effectively. Because, I mean, mm-hmm. that's something I'm trying to, trying to do now too and just trying to not spread myself too thin but also give myself some more time to be able to work on other things on the business too and have some more people creating content in the back. So if I do miss a day, at least something's being done. Right, exactly. Yeah, not for sure. And then you also have, I guess, partnerships out. So, so you have your brand partnerships, obviously, within, say, the affiliate side with supplements and things like that. But you also have, I guess, your sponsoring events and partners. For example, USA Weightlifting. I don't know if you're going to be in Colorado for Nationals end of this month. If you are, I'll see you there. <laughs> if not, but... <laughs> I, 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 won't, I won't, sadly. I, I hate to miss Nationals. Nationals is my, is, is my favorite. Um, but I will probably miss Nationals this year, unfortunately. Oh, damn. All good. But, I mean, you have that sponsorship. How did you go about I mean, create, How did you help go, go about creating that partnership? Yeah, I mean, that was a, a really uh, fun, innovative process. Uh, it was a largely spear, spearheaded uh, you know, our, at the negotiation table with Phil Andrews when he was CEO of USA Weightlifting. He's yep. now CEO of USA Fencing. Yeah. Shout out to Phil if you're listening. Phil's a, a great friend of mine and just someone who's, I think, so impactful in sport. In he has been in multiple countries, right? He's just he's just done so much, um, and you know Phil was really looking to revamp a lot of how USA Weightlifting did business, and they were looking for a media partner that that understood it, that was endemic to the space, right? They didn't want someone who would they they wanted people who knew the difference between weightlifting and powerlifting, so to speak, right? And we and we were those partners, right? We were those partners, um, and so that's a partnership that we're really proud of. It, we're actually in our second edition of the partnership because we sign because uh, it being a, a you you know an Olympic sport, they do things on the the four year cycles, basically based around Olympic cycles. So we're on our second four year partnership with USA Weightlifting right now. Wow. Okay. How much detail are you able to go in on that deal regarding that? Um, it doesn't have to be monetary, but more kind of like what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. I mean, we work with them on a variety of content. The content that we work with them on, we actually separate out from our normal content. It actually has a different disclaimer. Um, because I, I, I remind people, if something bad happens with USA Weightlifting, we also write on that. We report on that independently, right? Okay. So they don't get, like, veto power on our content or anything like that. Um, they've syndicated our content before. We obviously uh, power their uh, color commentary at their events. Um, you know, we do get some exclusive news from them when things happen, which is very cool. Athlete access, event access, things like that. Um, okay. So... You know, it, it's it's a it's a a partnership with a lot of moving parts um, that scales up and down depending on you know less happens in the winter because there's less going less going on in weightlifting, right? You know, more happens in the summer because there's more going on, right? So yeah, it's kind of how how we break it down. Do you plan on doing that with more organizations? I see you have um, I think the para powerlifting as well, but are you plan to do that with more strength yeah. sports, just for, almost like for exclusive access. I would love to. Um, I think that. You know, there have been a lot of there's been a lot of upheaval in strength sports recently. Um, you know, we, you know, full disclosure, I was personally interested in doing something with the International Weightlifting Federation, but I was worried about um, I was worried about allegations of corruption. Turns out, those were true and actually we much can, worse than I we, even we, thought. We can talk after this uh, off air. Yeah, we can talk my, after this. About, my my about, wife was part of the athletes' commission, and uh, yeah, went through, yeah, went through and suddenly, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, suddenly uh, ten million. Ten, someone stole ten million dollars, basically. Like, wow. Okay, um, that's bad. <laughs> and uh, so, and then powerlifting is a very fragmented space right now, um, especially in the United States. Right, federations have kind of been allied or broken off allies. Shit, like it's just, it, it, it's a fractured space. CrossFit has undergone a lot of organizational upheaval recently. Um, so I would be interested in more of those. We actually do a lot of um, work with World Strongest Man, right? That's probably our, one of our one of our closer relationships. Um, we're the only media outlet that's had boots on the ground covering that live, basically through the pandemic to now. Um, so, and we do have a good relationship with CrossFit. We have a good relationship with a lot of other organizations. We haven't formalized any additional partnerships uh, in the past year with those organizations. I would be interested in doing that. I think the timing has to be right, and the value has to be there for both parties, obviously. You know, we're a network amplifier. They're, they're a legitimacy lender, but they have to have legitimacy to lend. We have to be able to amplify, you know, their, their content visibility. It has to work both ways. Yeah, that's fair enough. Do you miss being in the weeds of writing the content? Oh, yeah, for sure. I do. I do. <laughs> um, I definitely do. Yeah. But you know what? It, it's, I think doing more on video uh, with our expanded video and podcasting strategy will kind of scratch that itch, hopefully. But mm-hmm. yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, I, I, I know because I, I sit there, I write most of the content as well. And so it's, it's enjoyable for me to do and I kind of, I pick some topics that maybe I want to learn more on so I can go deep into the weeds on it and it kind of keeps me fresh at least while I'm not coaching and things. So I enjoy doing it and I'm trying to hire more people to do things, but at the same time, I want to keep, keep my hands wet in there too, you know? The best way to learn anything is to research and write on it yeah. or, or have to teach it. Writing's a lot like having to teach something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And well, I guess, I mean, we, we touched on the idea of, of news kind of being like your your unique uh, I guess start to the website, but what do you think separates the site now compared? I mean, there's there's so many damn big fitness sites out there that are, I mean, to be honest, a lot of the content's dog shit. I mean, men's health and all those like I'll say it, I'll say it on this podcast. All those all that content's so bad. But um, what what is it that that you believe is what separates Barbear from a lot of these other bigger sites? We are still. I will say they're actually not that much bigger than us. Uh, we might be overtaking some of them uh, pretty soon, which is very exciting. Um, we're still by strength athletes for strength athletes, right? We're all we're strength nerds, right? Like you know, we we love this stuff. Uh, we eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff. Um, you know, it it's not a requirement. You, people have joked you have to like deadlift a certain amount to work at Barbed. Absolutely not. But if you don't like talking about deadlifts, you're probably not going to enjoy working at Barbend. You know what I mean? It's it's very self-selecting, um, and we just we we love this stuff. There's an authenticity uh, that I think people can sense in our content because it's by people who truly care and people who make this a part of their practice and their daily lives. So I I think that's our that's our real advantage. Mm, I, I like I like that for. Especially for a lot of our audience. A lot of our audience, obviously, are, are website builders, niche website builders, run display ads, affiliates kind of stuff. And I think a lot of people are now turning more towards things that they can show expertise on, or at least they can show experience on, right? To be able to show within yeah. the content that they've done the thing, they've been there, you know, they have the pictures, the video, they can talk about things that other people cannot because they've done the thing. And that seems to be, as you, I, I mean, as you alluded to there, it sounds like that is the big differentiator between barbend and then a lot of these average fitness magazine sites that kind of just spit out 500 words on random stuff uh, you you i might quote you on that actually that that we might be changing our about page a little bit because frankly like we don't spit out 500 random words on random <laughs> things right we do it with intent yeah. um we do it with expertise and if we don't have that expertise we go out and we try and find it yeah right no. so I'll be uh, expecting that backlink then from the about page. <laughs> 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 oh, now, th- this is this has been awesome, David. Honestly, I'm going to be selfish here because I want to talk to you after this. I know you get a hard hard stop uh, in about 20-ish minutes or so, but I think we've shared quite a bit. If anyone wants to find you and see what you're up to, follow the the progress of Barbie and, and what you're doing, where can they do that? 
Well, the best place is barben.com. Uh, also check out breakingmuscle.com. Listen to the Barben podcast, which I still host, uh, which is a big portion of, of what I do these days, especially as we expand that effort in the near future. We've also had some really cool guests. We've had like actual celebrities on. Uh, <laughs> Ice-T was on the podcast last year. Like, oh, damn. We had some really cool, cool, cool people. Yeah, it's been fun. Um, I'm like, oh, I get to talk to them. Uh, <laughs> not as exciting as this, but, you know, they're, they're still exciting. <laughs> and then um, if you want to follow me personally, uh, I am a pretty boring person. I want to just put that out there. Uh, but if you want to follow me, Instagram at David Thomas Tao. I'm on Twitter at, at D underscore Tao, D underscore T-A-O. Message me. I get back to basically everyone. Email me at David at barben.com. Would love to hear from you. Perfect. No, well, uh, thanks for coming on and sharing your story and, share, and sharing how you got started with Barbend and, and everything you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.